ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to Lore Week. I'm your host. I'm tired. I didn't even stay up for the entirety of the marathon. I'm just tired. Oh my goodness. <laughs> wow. I really didn't. Uh, I, I, I basically retired to my bed and had my phone, had the stream up. And they were starting the Super Metroid run. And I remember being slightly awake right about the time they reached Brinstar. Because I remember looking at some of the specific tricks he was doing and being very impressed by them. And then, you know, I remember being woken up by the, Hey, we're done, and it's in Orlando. I was like, huh? What? <laughs> good, uh, good GDQ this year, I would say. Very good GDQ this year. I mean, there were like a couple of runs that were eh, but otherwise I'd say they, they were fairly high quality across the board, at least in my opinion. What do you guys think? For the five of you who actually watched it. <laughs> I suppose we should just go ahead and jump into this because we have a bunch of stuff to cover today. Mostly questions. I get the weird feeling people are asking more Tumblr questions now, now that I'm answering them on channel. But Q&A has always been a weirdly big part of this, sh this show. Like, even back when I was just doing this in the office. Remember when I used to do just non-stop Q&A videos? Like, so much that I had to actually cancel them? <laughs> because they were overwhelming my free time? Yeah. Anyways. How's the audio volume, by the way? I'm... I'm trying a new setting here and I want to know how it sounds and you guys always insist that I'm too quiet so <laughs> by the way yes for those of you not aware um, hello to autumn or out oh no I'm gonna totally butcher this autumn 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 Let's try this. Hi to Sweden. Because Sweden's awesome. Um, yes, for those of you not aware, we'll go ahead and start with this. So, I'm actually not done with the YouTube stuff. I actually did get a lot of work done this last week, even despite the GDQ run going. So, I am very close to being done with, with the YouTube side of my, my, the work that I want to get done. I have six videos left to record... And then I have uh, one intro to render. That's going to be an overnight thing for a couple days. And then I have 22, no, 23 episodes to render after that. And then I'll have 23 episodes to upload. And then I'll be done. Then I'll be caught up. I am hopeful to get all that done before Thursday, actually, because I'd really like to have a little extra time to do more research on the Assassin's Creed series before I just dive into it. I may not. <laughs> just being honest here. Uh, I have, however, already done some work on getting ready for the Assassin's Creed lore run right now. I'm actually pretty happy with the setup we're going to do. I'm not going to tell you what that is. You'll find out Friday. But once we do get to Friday, we are going to basically be right back to streaming full-time. Um... So we're going to do the Assassin's Creed lore run. Uh, I don't know how long that's going to run. That's why we don't have anything else on the schedule right now, other than the obvious. After that, we are going to do the Kingdom Hearts stream. And not the Kingdom Hearts 3 one. The lead-up to Kingdom Hearts stream. That's, I believe, on the 27th. I've actually already got my notes for that stream right here. Already jotted out and ready to go. And that'll be the, here's Kingdom Hearts up to this point kind of a thing. No, no costumes. I don't have $400 and... I can't justify it either, especially not right now, since I'm moving soon. Um, so, that's uh, that's where we're going to do the Assassin's Creed lore run, and then we're going to go ahead and do the uh, the Kingdom Hearts lead-up stream. It's going to be right after lore week that day. And then we're, of course, going to stream Kingdom Hearts 3 on February, because you guys voted for us to do it a week later. And after we get to a... After we're finished with Kingdom Hearts 3, which I have no idea how long it's going to take, we're going to do the Neverwinter Nights lore run. And then we're going to go ahead and just do a whole lot of streams. We're just going to be streaming for like the next eight months. So I hope you guys like streaming. I really do. <laughs> because that's what's going to be happening for the next eight months or so. 
Uh, now, I saw a couple questions there. Let's see. The Swedish gentleman who's... I have no idea how to pronounce your name because I'm awful and horrible. Uh, so the specific games we will be playing will be Assassin's Creed 2, Assassin's Creed Brotherhood, and Assassin's Creed Revelations. However, I am going to be showing you bits of Assassin's Creed 1 and Assassin's Creed 3. I'll explain more in detail why Friday, but I actually put a lot of, of thought into exactly how to do an Assassin's Creed lore run. Because, as we'll discuss Friday, there's not really one Assassin's Creed story. It's not like one cohesive thing. It's not like Diablo 1, 2, or 3, or Half-Life and Half-Life 2, or whatever. It's this. So we're going to parcel it out, if that makes any sense. Um. Oh, oh, yay, Superman Prime. That's that's awesome. Yeah, that's true. Tonic, in the Swedish Empire always conquers everything. Uh, my third Kingdom Hearts lore run. This will be. This won't be a full Kingdom Hearts lore run, though. As for Aethel, uh, what do you mean? What I mean, no costumes. So, <laughs> that's actually a long and complicated topic, which I've discussed many times before. But let's just say there's a reason I wear a suit uh, on stream nowadays, and that's my normal. Now, Emma's Cardo over there. He's insane. For subscribing to me, but he's still awesome for doing it. And so I just want to say thank you to MS Cardo. Would you like to put that towards anything? I have updated the website. It is updated as of right now, as of this morning, actually. Also, hi, Dante. I'm glad to see you. We'll be streaming a lot more in the future, so I hope to see you more there. Uh, Annie Lee, what's up? Goodbye. <laughs> I hope, hope your day is good. I don't know if I look good in a suit. I, uh, I definitely look better than I did in that outfit, though. That's for certain. <sighs> what province am I hoping? What province do I want the next Elder Scrolls to be in? Um, Black Marsh. That's just such an obvious one. Oh, my God. <laughs> I'm, I'm being attacked. What's going on here? Okay, hang on, hang on, hang on, hang on. So, Emma's Cardo. Let's start with the top. Cardo. What's that meme come from? I've seen that lately, Hazardous. So, he put it towards Young Justice. Oh, actually, that's a different category. I'm going to put that down here. There we go. There we go. I keep track of the Mini Nation stuff separate. It's the same document, but I put it in a different place because I'm organized. Um, so I'm going to say hello to Lump Lord. Lump Lord, thank you very much. What would you like to put your sub towards? Ice Tray, what the hell are you doing? Pay close attention. Hopefully you'll learn something. Oh, my God. What are you guys doing? Okay, hang on, hang on. Was not ready for this. This is why we always have our little kind of intro thing here before we really get into it. <laughs> what do we got here? So first there was something from Ice Tray. Thank you very, very, very much, Ice Tray. I, 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 as ever, do appreciate your support a lot. I don't know if I get that across vocally enough, but thank you. Um, so I'm going to put that towards... Uh, just making sure I'm getting that right. Yeah, Oras. Ice Tray. Let's do this, there we go. Thank you. Uh, what's Assassin's Creed Rouge, Visual? I've never heard of that game. Oh my god. And I'm putting Dark Messiah. Thank you very, very much, Dark Messiah. I will put that towards... Or excuse me! Wow! Thank you very, very much, Vigilant. I will put that towards Dark Messiah. Thank you. Um, oh, apparently it's an ad for some Mafia City mobile game. Gotcha. Thank you very, very much, Renegade. What would you like to put your, that towards? Now, someone earlier asked, what are the choices? To which I say, website, website, website. I, <laughs> there's a thing, um, I, I actually forget the proper, I forget the proper terminology for it. There is actually a marketing concept. It's basically called constantly remind people of something. <laughs> and the more you do it, the more likely it is, the more people will become aware of the fact that that's a thing. So, so, you know, it's not a meme, as weird as that may sound. It's not a meme that I keep saying, website, website, website. That is actually a, a legitimate marketing strategy I am employing to constantly try to make people aware of the fact that I have a website, that I keep it updated, and that it has, you know, a fairly large amount of information on it. All the Loriums are there, the Cordons project's being archived there. We've got all of the uh, the ratings for the premiere runs, the in-depth classics, and, of course, all of the future... Uh, streams, all the future streams that are either scheduled or being funded, as well as future lore runs. All that stuff's on the website. So, <laughs> there's a reason. Yeah, it is actually the Coke method. That's exactly correct, Ethel. Again, there is a proper term for it. I don't remember what it is right now. But it is the Coke method of marketing. Coca-Cola. 
you know, hey, Coca-Cola, hey, Coca-Cola. Because you might be, because you know, how many of you ever wondered, why do I keep saying Coca-Cola ads? Everyone knows what Coca-Cola is. That's why. It's because they are constantly trying to saturate the market with acknowledgement that they exist. That's why they keep putting so much money into their ad budget, even though they're Coca-Cola and one of the most prolific soda companies in the world. That's why they do that. So, website, website, website. <laughs> You've got it, Lump Lord. I actually already have uh, that here. So, Lump Lord 2. And that was Tales of Vesperia. You haven't seen a Coca Cola ad in years. I have, but I go to the movies. <laughs> I cannot, this is not a joke. Me and Third have kind of a running gag where the only reason we go to theaters anymore is to see those Coke ads. Because they usually like to have this thing. I love you, SJ. They have this thing where they have, like, fan... Um, they, they, they support fan projects to do, like, little 40-second fan films right before an actual film. And those films are always Coke-related. You know, they're, they're Coke advertising, in other words. So Coke funds the, the, the film uh, student to make a little project, and Coke gets the advertising out of it. <laughs> so it's a pretty common thing to the point, I'd say like 95% or so of movies we go to see has that. Speaking of which, we're going to see uh, Transformers Bumblebee tomorrow. I don't even know what I'm expecting. I'm really not. Like, this is just kind of a... Okay. <laughs> we'll see. We'll see. We'll talk about it next week. Actually, next week will be the, the 20th. Yes, so yeah, we'll talk about that next week. Um... Yeah, my info tab on Twitch is a little more out of date. And by a little bit, I mean I haven't updated in months. <laughs> so, we'll see. Um, okay. It was between... The, so, some of you are probably wondering, why are you going to see Bumblebee? Well, A, we like to go to the movies. But B, uh, Bumblebee and Spider-Man into whatever the verse were the two options. And we basically were just ambivalent between the two of them. So, the coin decided on Bumblebee. So, that's why we're going to see that. Like Maze! Thank you very, very much, Maze. Would you like to put that towards anything? Would anyone like to put that towards anything? If Renegade, I haven't heard your, your what you want to put that towards. If you don't hear me say it, I haven't got it written down, because I always say it out loud. <sighs> Anyways, sorry. Uh, oh, you got it. So hang on. Renegade. Rene no, I'm saying that wrong completely. Renegadevi. There we go. Tales of the Spirit. I try to make sure I spell it right in my notes. Pretty much straight off of the Twitch thing. Yeah, the coin has always been a Transformer. We all know this. Hi, Sakage. So, um... Assassin's Creed Rogue. I, the coin has decided, Cashel. Okay. Um, where's my notes? My non-this-related notes. Okay, uh, so a couple, couple news tidbits. First, it's Huthor. <laughs> Never going to get this across. Thank you, Huthor. Uh, Thronebreaker, so stated. Thank you, again. Um, and Maze is going to put that towards Maze 88, Atelier, etc. That's literally how I have it in my notes, Atelier, etc. We have a new donation button on the website. Now, don't use that. Let me just start. I'm still trying to figure out how the hell it works. It's a it's an entirely new company called DonorBox. And I'm still trying to figure out some of the specifics of DonorBox and how to make that work. Uh, the button is there because I'm doing some live testing because the only way to do live testing is to do it live. Um, but I'm encouraging you guys not to use that yet until it's actually ready to go. Right, The point of it is not to, you know, ha, ha, give me more money. It is there specifically for uh, people who don't want to support me on Patreon anymore because I know there's some people who don't want to do that. And we've already talked about that. We've already discussed that. This is the best option I've been able to come up with with this thing. I don't know if it'll work long term. Again, we're still doing long t life testing. But I wanted to explain what the donation button was and why it was there. Um, you guys have phones, right? So they're making a new uh, Alien game on the phone. Speaking of ports, <laughs> that's all I'm saying about that topic. We're just going to move on here. Um, Dragon's Dogma is coming out on the Switch. 
like like say Venters over there, he's he's not coming out on the Switch. I'm not sure why. I gotta be honest, I would buy Venters in a heartbeat if he came out on the Switch. <sighs> Thank you very much, Venters. Put it towards Fire Emblem. What's the percentage take on that donation? Uh, huge. <sighs> Assuming it goes correctly. I, I shouldn't say that. According to their documents, they should be taking 3% of the cut. I don't know how much of that's going to be true, though. And they also go through Stripe, which takes another percent on top of that. So basically, we'll see, Hazardous. There's a reason I'm doing live testing of this. I'm not, I'm not willing to vouch for a company that I haven't really been able to dig my teeth into yet. Dragon's Dogma is coming out on the Switch, which is awesome. Um, I actually rather liked Dragon's Dogma. It had issues. It really did. But it was still an enjoyable game, and having it portable sounds kind of awesome. The one thing I'm wondering is, are they going to continue the multiplayer element? Because that's kind of a thing with Dragon's Dogma, right? And considering that the, the Switch has the whole Switch Online crap, I mean, I don't know. Uh, Final Fantasy is coming out with not a mobile game! I, I know this sounds like a weird thing to comment on, but I was really shocked that they're not coming out with a new mobile game. For those of you who haven't heard me say this before, at the moment Square Enix has something like 13 or 14 concurrent uh, mobile games going right now that they're actually making and that they're actually updating. Which is insane. <laughs> However, they're making a Final Fantasy digital card game, which is actually going to be a browser game. Now, yeah, I know, right, Hazardous? Which is good. Now, the Final Fantasy digital card game, you're probably thinking, well, what's the name of the game? Well, I just told you. It really is called Final Fantasy digital card game. That's, that's the name of the game. <clears throat> no, it's not Triple Triad. <laughs> it's a new thing. I know, right, Danny? It's just, I should have kept my mouth shut about Elder Scrolls. Blades hasn't even out yet. Warcraft 3 is ever ported to the iOS. How, I mean, whatever. Ports, whatever. I don't know. Uh, I mean, for those of you not aware, browser games are a little bit bigger in countries that are not this one. So maybe that's not as stupid as it sounds. Like, if you were like, here's a new United States game. It's a browser game. People would be like, what? Um, Star Trek 4 was canceled. This is not a shock. I want to stress this. I'm going to talk about this briefly. Actually, you know what? Let's save that for a moment. Let's switch over to the fact that they've announced they're making a new Bravely Default game. I want to talk about that briefly as well. But I wanted to talk about that next to the Square thing. Because, obviously, Square... Uh, so Carino, for example, he's actually made by Square as well, but they, they haven't really gotten all the glitches out, because although he's awesome, and I thank him for his donation, he hadn't actually told me what he wants to put that sub toward, so as soon as he re rectifies that, it will be awesome. But Bravely Default is a series that I have extremely strange feelings about. If I were to ever sit down and do my own review system for the Bravely Defaults, I have a feeling they'd end up with a huge amount of gameplay pluses, and probably be a net negative when it comes to story. Because, and I'm not going to spoil anything, but I really feel like the story in, in general of the Blade Default games is just lacking. The characters aren't that interesting, they're way too exaggerated, and some of the writing is just weird, and the plot is... worse. <laughs> it's, it's just, huh? What? But the gameplay, the gameplay is one of the best designed, and I mean this with total sincerity, the gameplay is one of the best designed JRPGs I've ever seen. They, they do so many things right, it's weird. By the way, hi, Palayan. Um, it's just... I, I don't even know what to say about it. So anyways, they're making a new Bravely Default. My very first knee-jerk reaction to a new Bravely Default was, huh, I wonder if the story will be worth a damn this time. <laughs> yes, the first Bravely Default had very stupid requirements for its true ending, which I'm not going to spoil here. <laughs> We're not doing that. Uh, Randy Pitchford, nope, I ain't touching that with a 10-foot pole. I shouldn't have even said that name. So, in other words, no, Lump Lord. Uh, the Picard series, there's not really any Picard series news. Uh, Picard is retired, the Romulan Empire has fallen, that's all we got. That's it. <laughs> Nothing really new there. Um, now, I do want to talk about Star Trek IV. <laughs> so, Star Trek IV has been cancelled, which, again, is not a surprise. For those of you not aware, one of the biggest reasons why Star Trek, that is to say Star Trek 2009, uh, succeeded so well, 
is because of the fact that it was in a specific point in cinematic history. We hadn't had Star Trek at all for a while, ever since Enterprise had finally shut down and Nemesis had basically torpedoed the series. That was the end of Star Trek. So it was our first Star Trek for a while, and we didn't have anything like that in the big screens. So, Star Trek 2009 was a financial success. Whether it was a critical success or whether it was a good movie, that's up to you. I'm not willing to place judgment on that. I personally didn't care for it. I, I felt that there were good parts and that there were bad parts. And then there were a lot of bad parts. Star Trek Into Darkness also sold reasonably well for what amounts to the same general reason. Star Trek Into Darkness is a very strange film for me to comment on, as I actually did when it came to my rumination on it, because there are just as many good parts as bad parts. I'd still probably call Into Darkness a net negative because the script is one of the most awful things I've ever seen in my life. But regardless of that, and super blood, then we had Star Trek Beyond. Now, Star Trek Beyond just did not actually sell nearly as well, despite arguably being a better film than the previous two. Why? Force Awakens had come out by then. See... As I mentioned, Star Trek 2009 was at a unique point in cinematic history. Star Trek Beyond came out after we'd already had two, let's call it mixed Star Trek films, creative, creatively mixed, you know, people disagreeing with it, and, um, and Star Wars had started coming out on, on films as well. So for people who are not sci-fi fans, that type of science fiction big screen film thing was being fulfilled by Star Wars. And the Star Trek fans had had a mixed reaction to the previous two and were more sated because, you know, there wasn't this huge dearth of content. So it's very logical that Star Trek Beyond would not succeed as well financially, even though I personally think it is the best of those three films. This leads us naturally into Star Trek IV, which is basically in a worse position than ever because now we actually have not only one Star Trek show going live now, but two new ones that they're working on, the Picard one and the animated one, as well as the idea of the fact that Star Wars movies are coming out basically yearly at this point. You see the problem. It is very logical that they would go ahead and torpedo Star Trek IV. I don't think it was a good decision, to be completely honest with you, but I can see why they did that. I know, right, Zenslayer? It's kind of weird. Possibly, Adam, but I haven't heard anything about that personally. That doesn't mean it's not true. It's just mean I haven't heard anything about it. <sighs> oh, yeah, there's also... I sh I'm sorry, I forgot to mention Orville is also coming out right now as well. And even though Orville is not Star Trek, Orville is very much filling... Let's put it to you this way. Between Star Trek Discovery and Orville, basically all... I shouldn't say that so inclusively. Most Star Trek fans have at least one show that they like that's Star Trek right now. Right? I, I imagine actually most of you would agree with me on this. Even though there are, of course, people who don't like both shows, if you were to look at an aggregate, I'd say probably about 80% of Star Trek fans are satisfied by either Discovery or Orville. Or both. <laughs> right? <sighs> um, I think, has Discovery started coming out again yet? I won't care until season two is done, because I'm not paying for CBS All Access for anything more than a splurge. I have enough bills as it is, and I'm about to increase my rent, so. <laughs> Orville also took uh, a while for me to... It, I finally sat down and watched, like, all of season one or whatever of Orville. Like, the first, uh, I guess, 12 episodes. And... I will admit the show started to grow on me. There's a sort of genuine passion behind it, which I really appreciate. You can tell that several of the people involved, most especially the writers and the guest stars, and of course, um, McFarlane himself, are really into it. Like, you can tell they care. And I appreciate that. I, I always appreciate that, even if it's something that I don't otherwise care for. And I do have to say that, while I don't like the humor, I actively do dislike the humor. I've never liked Seth MacFarlane's approach to humor. The actual stories have been very interesting. For anybody curious, my favorite episode so far has been the social media planet. <laughs> that... <sighs> yeah. <clears throat> yeah, he keep... That's another thing. Some... Seth MacFarlane... Uh, this is actually a slightly different one, Hazardous, but yes is the answer to your question. Um... <laughs> the social... 
If you haven't seen it, I actually recommend, if you have a chance, watch the social media planet, because that one is just... <laughs> oh, it's horrible! It's one of the most terrifying dystopias I've ever seen. And it's so believable. Anyways. <clears throat> but yeah, um... The, uh... <laughs> Uh, I'm sorry, I've lost my train of thought here. Kinda dystopian. My arse, that is full t full tilt dystopia. It, yeah, it is the tyranny of the majority. That is exactly what it... Okay, so quick premise, right? I won't tell you the whole plot. But the pl planet social media, it's a planet where everyone has to have, like, a button, which is tied into the social network that co co goes across uh, the entire planet. There's an up and a down, a like and a dislike. Everything is judged based on that. Everything. Social interactions, uh, economic ec interactions and decisions, cultural norms and, and, and trends, the legal justice system. In other words, you, you could be put on trial for having too many down votes. And the way you are, succeed or fail at the trial is by having a sufficient amount of up votes to contradict it. It's horrifying! And he does, and he does a specifically good job of just showcasing exactly how terrifying it really is. <laughs> yeah, it's it's a global Yelp. My favorite part. This is a very minor thing, but if, uh, uh, my favorite part is when they, he goes into like a coffee shop or whatever, and they want to order something. That's like, well, we won't serve you. You don't have a hundred thousand or more likes. <laughs> Bye. Lighthearted. <laughs> <clears throat> Anyways, good episode. Moving on. <sighs> the, there's a company. Uh, no, wait, Nymph, no! Um, there's a company that's making a new console that's intended to be the new console, the best console, to give competition to Microsoft, Sony, and Nintendo. Okay, new blood can be a good thing. Uh, let's see, it's called the Mad Box, all right. Uh, the Mad Box is going to have an absolutely insane hardware thing. It's supposed to be able to do 4K with VR and 3D and a bunch of other stuff. Like, in other words, it's supposed to be a PC. A high-end PC. It's going to be pretty expensive, and it's going to be a high-end PC. I, uh... <laughs> I don't know what else to add to that. We'll see, historically speaking, how this goes. But it really is a strange direction. Like, if someone else wanted to slip into the console market... Whoops, 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 whoops. Sorry. If someone else wanted to slip into the console market right now, I can kind of see it, you know? But why would you go in that direction, of all things? Like... That is an extremely niche market. It's, okay, I want a PC, but I don't want to buy a PC. And you know what's funny? Is there's already a niche for that. It's called the Xbox. That's already what the Xbox is aiming for. I, I've discussed this before. It's one of the reasons I'm actually in favor of the X-Bone, despite the fact that I will never buy one. Or I shouldn't say never, but I have no intention to, because it's a, it's got a good purpose in existing. It's for people who want to play video games, but either... Don't ha can't afford a PC, or don't want to get ripped off by, from by a PC, <coughs> Alienware, or don't know how to build their own, so they want to make so they get an Xbox. <laughs> you know, done. <laughs> <laughs> well, I destroyed the Earth, Fab. Sorry. Or yeah, if you like Halo so much, you're willing to, to pay for a console for it. I mean, I guess the other niche. <laughs> <sighs> Anyways, that's it for, like, little news. Um, let's talk about big news. Let's get our first timestamp here. Although I did talk about the Star Trek thing longer than I expected to, but, you know, whatever. So let's start off by talking about... Well, I actually want to talk about this first. Let's redo my own notes order here. So I woke up super tired. So Bungie has 
bowed out of Activision Blizzard. Now, this is actually an extremely strange situation. I actually have a pretty good idea of what's happening. This is guesstimates, because we don't know. We don't actually know the specifics, yes we did, Adam, of what's actually happening here. Let's just go ahead and start with that. We don't know the truth. I, I want to make that nice and obvious, so everything... What I just told you, here, here's the facts. Bungie's leaving. Bungie is retaining publishing rights to uh, Destiny. Uh, Destiny is going to remain on the BNet launcher for the foreseeable future. And NetEase has given $100 million investment into Bungie to make their next game. Those are the facts. That's it. That's all. Okay? So now let's get into conjecture. For those of you not aware, NetEase is a scum-sucking company from hell that is based in China. Um, no, those two points are unconnected. I just thought I'd mention it. Uh, but... Uh, they also are have already done quite a bit of financial work with Activision Blizzard. Uh, the most obvious thing being the recent Diablo Immortal, but that's not the only thing that they've been doing. And there has been several uh, stock movements between NetEase and, or rather, the owners of NetEase and Activision Blizzard. So that's a thing. The, so basically, it is a fact that NetEase and Activision Blizzard are pretty close. So I guess I shouldn't say that's conjecture. That is fact. The conjecture part is that I think that this is why Bungie is able to smoothly slide out and retain publishing rights. Because Bungie leaving... Okay, sure. Bungie leaving in name... Okay, that's pretty surprising. Bungie leaving in name and also taking the publishing rights is almost astonishing. That basically doesn't happen. Usually that only happens in three circumstances. One, the parent company is desperately unloading assets to avoid... Uh, financial issues, which could be happening right now. Uh, two, they have an amenable partnership with a third party, which is what I think is happening here. Or three, everything's gone to hell. <laughs> Basically. Three is the uh, three is the hard to predict thing. You know, people making stupid questions, uh, stupid decisions, that kind of thing. Yeah, I know, right? How's this? So. I think that because of the third-party partnership between NetEase, Activision Blizzard, and NetEase and Bungie, that's why Bungie is able to leave so amicably underneath the Activision Blizzard umbrella. But the, the fact that they are taking the publishing rights is very strange. Now, that being said, it is probably worth noting that based on our current information, again, conjecture, this means that Destiny 1 and 2 are still Activision Blizzard properties. However, Bungie now has the ability to go forward with Destiny in the future conjecture, but that is what it seems to be looking like right now. Now, the fact that NetEase has basically said, hey, that's... I, I, I personally cannot perceive a way in which NetEase buying into Bungie is a good thing. I, I can't. I'm sorry. The, the catch, and this is, this is interesting, the catch here is we're not 100% sure of the nature of this investment. It is possible that NetEase bought Bungie and basically owns Bungie now. It is possible that they gave them investment for a specific project, basically NetEase acting as the publishers for Bungie. Um, it is possible that they did this as a straight-up loan, which is a thing that ha does happen every now and again. I don't know. We don't know. No, inf no public information, at least last I checked, which was this morning. So I don't know what to make of that. The best case scenario there would be the loan situation, but I don't know where they're, where they're going to go with this one. It's worth noting I have no personal investment because I was never a fan of Destiny. But, uh, yeah, yeah exactly, Corrales. Time will tell. I really don't know where this is going. Uh, this is interesting timing, though, because as several people in chat have already pointed out and questioned, this is very soon on the heels of Activision Blizzard undergoing fairly significant under-the-hood changes. Now, no, I'm not saying they're awful and terrible and they never were. Who thought you don't need to defend anything? I mean, from the from the corporate side of things, there has been uh, a bit of a shift in the guard, a bit of a shift in people bowing out and coming in. I do have to point out something, by the way. This is actually my very first thought when I saw this Bungie thing. So that's the second former Activision Blizzard development team that is now working with NetEase instead of Activision Blizzard. Remember the Hearthstone team and how they're making a game now under NetEase? 
Anyways. <clears throat> Don't know if that's significant. Just pointing it out. What's funny is, right now, if I had money, like, if I had real money, if I had, like, you know, if I was a millionaire or whatever, I would basically be doing exactly what NetEase is doing. I would be saying, hey, developers who are here, um, you know, Bungie, Hearthstone team, here's the Stone Storm team, maybe the StarCraft team. You want to work for me instead? I'll fund you. <laughs> and I would try to buy Blizzard, uh, Blizzard talent. So, I mean, it's a good move if you think about it. Because Activision Blizzard, whether this is smart or not, I don't know. But Activision Blizzard is divesting itself of resources. Uh, this comes, this is with regards to how much they're spending on specific products, services they're putting out, and actual personnel. So, this is a good time to to try and poach resources, to put it in the into the most blunt way I possibly can. And that's true, Pico. Bungie, yeah. So, we'll see. We'll see where this is going. I don't know. Uh, it, it would explain the Heroes of the Storm thing. You're absolutely right. It would explain the Heroes of the Storm thing. It would definitely explain the Hearthstone thing. This is still a lot of conjecture. That's why I, I keep using that word. Is because we, there's just a lot of details we don't actually know, unfortunately. This kind of internecine uh, office politics is the sort of thing that doesn't have to be public knowledge, unlike certain things. Although, that's a good segue into my next topic, public knowledge. How many of you know what the phrase securities fraud means? Honest question. This is almost a trick question, by the way. I'll go ahead and admit that. <laughs> So I see several answers. Fraud, lying to the SEC, frauds on security, insider trading. Um, basically, securities fraud is actually kind of a catch-all term. It can refer to <sighs> making investors buy or sell based on false information, embezzlement, falsified financial reports, lying to financial auditors, insider trading, stock manipulation, um, and front-running. All of those things are things that fall under the securities fraud umbrella. And that's unfortunate, because it means it's very generic. Why am I bringing this up? Well, Activision Blizzard is being invest investigated by a law firm as part of a class action suit for securities fraud. Now, I'm going to go ahead and just say this. This is actually strange. There is not a lot of information about this right now. Uh... <laughs> We do know that this lawsuit is happening. We do know that this investigation is happening. But again, securities fraud is an extremely broad term. I do want to comment on two of those things really quickly because uh, two of those, stock manipulation and front running, both describe specific aspects of corporate uh, manipulation that are actually illegal here in the States. Stock manipulation is basically saying, uh, like, okay, if I go in, this is a made-up example, if I go in and I say, man, I just buy, 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 and I have people I know or people who are part of the company use company funds or personal funds or whatever or investment funds in order to try and buy up stock to artificially increase the perceived value of the stock, thus increasing the stock price, that would be a form of uh, stock manipulation. Same in reverse. There's also front-running. Now, front-running is much easier to explain. Front-running is insider information. I know that we're about to release some super big product and it's not public knowledge yet. So I'm going to buy up tons of stock right now, knowing that our stock is probably about to skyrocket because of this new release. Oh, hey, it released. Oh, man, I made all this money. Insider trading, right? Insider information. That's front running. All of that stuff qualifies under securities fraud. Now, why is Activision Blizzard being investigated for securities fraud? So last I checked, which was about two days ago now, Activision Blizzard stock was down to $43 a share. I guess I can look that up right now. Let's just do that real quick. It is currently up to $46.54 a share, which is not much of a thing. 
I know that sounds like a strange statement. Obviously, it is down. Uh, that is an overall downward trend. However, as I pointed out either last week or the week before, I forget when, that's a trend right now in the tech market in general. So that's not necessarily indicative. However, apparently several people decided that the recent stock uh, dive, which happened from basically about November to now, is sufficient enough to investigate. Now, this is when we get into the realm of theory. Because... My personal theory on exactly why they're being investigated for this is that there are people... Okay. Is that during the recent... Uh, what's the term? <sighs> investor meeting. I can't think of the term. During the recent investor meeting, when... Uh, when, 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 they, when Activision Blizzard talked to its main investment teams and investment portfolios, it's entirely possible that they basically gave them a false image. And that would be that would qualify as uh, stock manipulation as well as a form of falsified financial reports. And they're like, "Hey, everything's great. Everything's doing awesome. Nothing's wrong whatsoever. We're definitely not about to lose several developers, uh, two CFOs, and we're not about to shut down the Hots team. We're not about to lose the Bungie team." The thing is, it is within the realm of reasonability that those, all of those things that I just mentioned and whatever else is happening that we don't even know about right now were things that they already knew about when the last shareholder meeting happened, which would have been the previous quarter, which was several months ago at this point. Because that's how corporations work. Things don't just happen overnight unless in their extremely rare circumstances. So they would have known about this stuff and might not have told this to the shareholders during that last quarterly meeting, which would therefore technically qualify as a securities fraud situation. Now, I do think that's kind of bull if that's true, but that's the best I got. Now, several people in chat have pointed out it. this may just be a situation of a falsified uh, investigation. It wouldn't be the first time that that sort of thing has happened. I don't know. This is very recent news, and there's not a lot of information about it whatsoever. The... <sighs> The nature of the legality of corporations is such that you can never go after a corporation for doing something wrong. You have to go after a corporation for doing something inaccurately because of, of the massive amount of legality that's going on when it comes to a corporation. By the way, hi, Kay, and hi, Zira. Oh, my gosh. So... I can't say whether or not I think Activision Blizzard deserves to be sued. I certainly do think that Activision Blizzard being sued isn't going to be an overall good thing, as horrible as that probably sounds, because lawsuits don't generally make things better. There are, of course, exceptions, but, I mean, <laughs> this is more or less literally the shareholders uh, uh, pursuing a suit against the company. That's that's not like, oh man, you know, they'll totally turn things around if that happens. You know, that's, that's not how that works. We'll see. We'll see, I don't know. But Sierra Hunter is trying to interrupt me. He's failing miserably. He didn't also tell me what he wanted to put that donation towards, so I'm afraid his interruption is 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 like a level one interruption. He needs to get to like level five or so. Thank you, Zero Hunter. What would you like to put that towards? In short, this is a whole lot of oh. Uh, but I wanted to comment on it. A lot of people, of course, have been following this, and I tend to kind of talk about financial stuff. Uh, and, of course, I've been following, you know, Activision Blizzard for... God, I don't know at this point. When did... When was Blizzard founded? <laughs> uh, if they are successfully sued, will this contribute to a supposed crash? Um, depends on what the nature of the suit is, because there are several ways to pursue a successful suit. Uh, one of them is simply to, you know, basically have the company pay out to the shareholders, which is probably the most likely thing. It's also possible they could hit, get hit with fines, depending on what they are found in, in violation of. Otherwise, this is probably mostly going to be a slap on the wrist and a PR hit more than anything else. Assuming, of course, that this suit is successful, which it may not be, because, again, we just have so little information on it. Now, I've given my own opinion on the supposed crash this is coming myself. All I'm going to say is mobile games, the mobile game market right now, and I'm not saying this to be pro or against mobile gaming, but the mobile gaming market right now is extremely similar to the Atari market right before the 70 crash, that's, and that's all I'm going to say about that. The world has, of course, changed, and the markets have changed, and the industry has changed, so who knows. But that's all I'm willing to say about that one. 
Zira Hunter gives it towards RE2. Thank you very much, Zira. Now, ah, the war has changed. <laughs> um, so enough doom and gloom. Uh, let's talk about Tumblr questions. You guys like Tumblr questions, but I got a bunch this week because, I, like I said, people are just asking more and more questions, I think, as a consequence of the fact that I'm doing these, which is fine. I like doing some of these. I, I try to answer most of the Tumblr questions just on Tumblr. It is nice to see that people are starting to be aware of the fact that I have a Tumblr and I use it as a QA. and a I know Tumblr has an absolutely awful reputation, and I understand that, but I have actually looked into this. It's not a joke. I've looked into this. There is no other program or site or plugin that does exactly what Tumblr does, because this is what Tumblr does, really quick. It allows you to ask a question of me. It allows me to answer it. It allows you to ask it anonymously without having to have a login or, or signing in or anything like that. And it has a nice, easy, simple way of pr pr showcasing all of the information, all of the questions and answers in a nice, digestible format. It, it, it's like the perfect Q&A thing. <laughs> it is more or less perfect for Q&A, and that's why I use it. I don't see any foreseeable future in me discontinuing using this, because there just is not another feasible format for this kind of thing. <sighs> so, first question, we got a couple, we got three Star Wars questions first, and then we've got a generic question, a Resident Evil question, a Warhammer question, and a Nintendo question, in that order. So, first question, let's get a timestamp here. How many of you know who HK47 is. Yeah, I'm probably the only person in the world who uses Tumblr as a Q&A forum, which is hysterical because it is the perfect Q&A site. I'm not even kidding about that. It's so stupid. Anyways. Um, how, okay, so the question, I suppose I should read the question out in its entirety, which is right here. Knowing what we know about HK47, um, what do you think if HK-47 was given full freedom of will, like his, his connection to Revan is, is cut and he is allowed to do whatever he wants, what do you think he would do? Would he go on a murderous rampage? Do you think he'd become a bounty hunter or a mercenary or an assassin for hire? Where do you think he would go given the choice to have the freedom of his own future? Free the droids. Yeah. I see a few people saying lead the droids. I see a few people saying assassin. I know my own thoughts on this one, but I wanted to ask you guys. He'd open a cantina! And <laughs> he would perfect how to kill people with poison, but like they would die hours later. Like he would want to try, it would be an art form thing, right? He'd be like, okay, so here's this drink, and this, thank you, Lincolnsey, and this specific thing will, you know, poison this specific race, but only in seven hours. <laughs> He's going to be in the middle of flying home, and then, ah, it'll be great. He'd find Revan. No, Revan's dead. I don't care what Tor says. Revan 2 is dead as well, damn it. I see a few people saying Rampage. I don't think he'd Rampage, personally. I just don't think it's in his personality. Uh, I suppose I should go ahead and explain here. I think HK is far more about the art of killing than the mass of killing. Or let me put this in another way. HK is the kind of person who would appreciate a gourmet, properly crafted, you know, very carefully cooked burger, and who would scoff at McDonald's. That's my take on HK. I think he would look at that like, yeah, no, no, like, why would I do mass killings? That's just beneath me. That's so passe. Anybody, anybody can pick, pick up a gun and just start shooting a lot of people. I got to do it proper like. And I think he would go, yeah, he'd be very precise. Of course I have micro -mono. I did it on stream even. And yeah, be, I think he would be the kind of person who would try to engineer the poisoning of, like, an entire, I don't know, just, like, one specific species on a station 
such that it would be engineered so that the, the other surviving species would start suspecting them and that would cause their own kind of a thing. Or maybe, you know, try to kill the people who just basically are so super well protected that they otherwise can't be defeated. Might actually become an assassin or a bounty hunter, but just because he needs money to keep doing his hobby. That kind of thing. That is probably the, the direction I would, I would think HK-47 would go in. Like, the art, you know? Oh, of course, meatbags are going to die. What else is life but killing meatbags? <laughs> he doesn't torture? Uh, I don't think he tortures. But yeah, I like... Um... A job to, just this is just making up something off the top of my head, uh, uh, taking a job to try and assassinate Palpatine. That's the kind of thing HK-47 would look at and be like, yes! <laughs> oh, that's going to be so difficult. I'm going to make that happen. It's going to work. Um, so, anyways. <laughs> so that's my take on it. That's what I think he would do. Speaking of Star Wars and Tor, or KOTOR, I should say, sorry. <laughs> Hate to confuse those two. Let's talk about Revan. Everyone likes Revan, right? He's super popular. So this question is kind of a weird. It's in what if. So you know, Q shows up and goes, Pah. What would happen if Revan and his companion, or her companions, on the Ebon Hawk are all transported to one year prior to the start of the Clone Wars, just before uh, Episode 2? What do you think they would think about the state of the Republic, the demilitarized Republic, the Force users, um, Candorous' opinion on Mandalore, it's, and what do you think they would do during the Clone Wars? It's just kind of a what-if KOTOR team brought into Clone Wars era. And let's assume that the usual Type 2 interactions are available, in which case they can talk and speak and otherwise interact with people. It's, it's just... We're already Q-snapping people 3,000 years in the future. I think we can manage that one. I do like that that maze. <laughs> By the way, hi, Disco Inferno. I like that idea. Yeah, God, nothing's different! This is the exact same situation we just left. What the hell? What is this crap? <laughs> How many years has it been? One? <laughs> Anyways. Um, yeah, no, I, I personally do think that a lot of them would just be like, you're kidding me! What is with this crap? Just, just the, all of them, all of them. Like, I think Karth would look at the Republic and be like, what is wrong with you? You don't even have a military. Why, why does the Trade Federation have a fleet and we have a nothing? And I think, you know, Mandalore would look at everything going, or excuse me, Mandalore, Candrus would look at everything going on with the Mandalorians, both sides, and just be, he would look at the Death Watch and be disgusted by how petty they are. Because let's be honest, Death Watch is basically just a bunch of thugs. And we know what Carr thinks about thugs, right? And then, of course, Car he would be like, ah, oh, screw this, I'm going to act the actual Mandalorians. And he'd see the pacifist Mandalorians and be like... And then he'd meet up with Jongo. And then it'd be cool. Karth would walk up to Jango and be like, hey, hey, bro. Jango would be like... Um... <laughs> you want a what? Uh, now, Revan... I think Revan would look at this situation... Did I say Karth? God damn it, I meant Candrus. I always forget his name. <laughs> I like to think that uh, Revan would look at the Jedi and just be disgusted. I think Joe Lee would too, but I mean, I mean, think I think Revan would look at this and be like, "What is wrong with you? Why are you so? <laughs> I... <laughs> I... The... <laughs> just, just a popoleptic, <laughs> or popoleptic? How are you supposed to say that? I could see Revan. No joke. I could see Revan teaming up with Palpatine or uh, Dooku, who at this point in time, of course, is very active. So you know. I don't think Revan would be able to determine Palpatine's true identity. Honestly, I don't. Palpatine was, was very, 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 very careful with that. There's multiple stories 
written about exactly how careful Palpatine was. Granted, a lot of those are in the EU now, but, you know, whatever. EU is best to you, am I right? I'm just kidding. I don't know which one is best. But, uh... <laughs> now, Takoida is correct. They're basically walking back into, like... I mean, the faces have changed! Um... I also think that... Joe Lee would just... Nope. <laughs> I'm not dealing with this anymore. Nope. Oh, I agree, Takoida. Palpatine's rule of two problem is just... just well, that would completely make anything go badly. I have to admit, it would be interesting to write the scenario, because I personally think... Uh, so, someone earlier, I think it was Vigilant, someone earlier said, this is a huge question, and he's right. Because this is one of those questions that would fundamentally change, like, all of the story. The prequels and the sequels, or excuse me, the prequels, the originals, and the sequels would all be fundamentally altered by the inclusion of this group in, in the Clone Wars era, just prior to the Clone Wars. I guarantee you that Revan, at the very least, would get very active involved in the Clone Wars, and I guarantee you several other characters would get very active as well. I also think, personally, that... Well, I don't think Revan could outplay Palpatine. Not a, not a chance in hell. I'm sorry. Palpatine is a manipulating genius. Revan is a tactical genius. Now, you might look, what's the difference? Well, now, Revan, what Revan would do specific, I don't know. It would be a fascinating story to write as like an Elseworlds kind of a thing. Because it really would change everything, wouldn't it? There's no way that this would not actually alter history. I don't know in which direction, though. Yeah, Bastila, I haven't mentioned Bastila. I haven't mentioned uh, HK. HK would be there. HK would just... HK, let's be honest. HK would just follow Revan. We cool, Revan? We cool? Um, I agree with that, Dakota. Now... It depends on the writer, Disco Inferno. I was thinking about Revan. I'm pretty sure Revan would, like, end up either finding out about or actively seeking out Thrawn. Because remember, there's a Thrawn in both timelines, and both of them are supposed to be military geniuses. I actually don't know that much about the AU Thrawn, so I can't comment on that with explicit knowledge. Aren't there, like, three Thrawn books now in the AU? Um, but I do think... Uh, I, I absolutely think Revan would gravitate towards Thrawn, and probably vice versa, honestly. I'm kind of deliberately leaving Kreia out of this one. I have a weird feeling that Kreia would just be like, Yeah! <laughs> Why? God, kill me! <clears throat> Excuse me. I do think... Hi, Max Time. I do think that... Uh... <laughs> uh, Bastila. Uh, Bastila, if she ended up joining the Order... See, the problem is we have to decide which Bastila... Because there's the Bastila who has basically been turned away from the Order, but is still good. There's the Bastila who's been turned away from the Order who is evil. And then there's the Bastila who's still part of the Order. And we have to decide which one of those three is the one being brought forward. Because I think they, they would react differently. I, I honestly think that uh, my Bastila, which is the good, not Order one, would not, absolutely not join the Jedi Order. Would just be like... Nuh, 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 nuh. I've already dealt with that. I've already dealt with that. I'm not dealing with that again. I'm pretty sure she would go with Revan. Duh. And the thing is, I don't know what Revan would do on a grand scale. Because I guarantee you he'd get involved. But I don't know where he'd go. There's just too many options there. I keep wanting to say she, by the way, because my Revan was she. But whatever. <laughs> my Revan was female. My, my, my exile was male. Go figure. Oh, Anakin would crush Revan like a bug. I'm sorry, Revan is not that good in a fight. That's not Revan's strength. Awesome, Max Time. Looking forward to seeing you. All oh, the sensitive to <laughs> Ooh, the huts. That's actually an interesting idea. And yeah, Revan making his own faction would make sense. But yeah, I, I agree, Takoya. Huts is actually a pretty smart move there. Yeah, I, I haven't mentioned Mission. I haven't mentioned Zalvar. I don't know, like... I don't know. There's... <laughs> Mission's a great character, but she's kind of small potatoes compared to most of the characters we're talking about. I'm not sure Mission would have any thing in the Clone Wars other than being loyal to Revan. Yeah, that's probably about as far as that would go. 
Cantina and Bar. We're too guys, guys, guys. Team Black Sun. Let's, let's just. There's this guy Shizor. He just took over. Let's go. Uh, let's not do that. Anyways. <laughs> Yeah, if Revan actually... We know that the criminal organizations actually thrived considerably during the Clone Wars. It's not unlikely. So, okay, how many... This is a... I'm, I'm about to spoil, spoil a small amount of the Clone Wars TV series. So on the off chance you don't want that to be spoiled, spoiler, 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 spoiler. So you remember how Darth Maul actually basically formed his own private criminal empire? Impromptu and ended up taking over a planet and, as a consequence, having significant influence on a neutral alliance. I have a feeling Revan could do that, but better. Again, I think Maul is better in a fight than Revan, I do. Maul's a hell of a d d death machine in a fight. But Revan has this going for him. I think he would make that work, personally. <laughs> Is what vaporware? Confused. Maul is half of a death machine and half of a death person? <laughs> Oh, ha ha, Iron God. <laughs> oh, sorry, Zed Slayer. I, yeah. I'm ignorant. Oh, Palpatine. Let's just assume that Viche or V. God, how do you say that freaking word? I, there's actually multiple pronunciations. Vitiate. Vitiate. Okay, let's let's go with that one. Let's assume Vitiate is just not involved. He's not here. He's he's just not a part of the equation. He is erased from existence. There we go. We're good. We're good. But yeah, I have a feeling that Revan. So here's okay. Here's my honest think of it. Revan goes, gets the support of the Huts and some of the other crime families. Revan basically builds his own little private organization on the side and pulls the hell out of the Clone Wars. Now, Revan's intention is probably to look at the at the Clone Wars, wait for the two powers to beat it out, see who's going to win, and base his long-term strategy on that. Because Revan is... This is good Revan, remember. This is redeemed Revan. He is interested in trying to make things better. I also think that after a year or two, or however long, after some time into the Clone Wars, he would start to notice how wrong the Clone Wars are on a macroscopic scale. Because A, he's sufficiently detached from the wars that he has the outsider's perspective, and B, he has the long-term planning and the macroscopic perspective in his mind enough to notice the pattern of the Clone Wars, which is that it's a, it's a, it's a scrapped war, right? It's, it's, it's a puppet war. Both sides are under the same control. And so I think Revan would slowly start to be like, wait a minute. What I'm not sure is what he'd do about that. I have no doubt Revan would figure out that there's something going on. I just don't know what he'd do about it. Yeah, it, yeah, it's a, you're, he's playing chess by yourself. I've done that before. <laughs> That's how you practice chess, right? What do I think the KOTOR 2 cast would do? I don't know. I, I, uh, I think Jongo is better... Huh? Uh, suited to answer that he's not here right now. <laughs> yeah, I think Revan would do some... Uh, there's a term for that. Uh, provocation scouting, basically. Alright, let's see what happens here. What would Palpatine do about Revan? Now, that's a much more interesting question. Let me make this clear. I think Palpatine, if he went at Revan full tilt, would crush Revan. I'm sorry. <laughs> I also, however, don't think that Palpatine would go full tilt after Revan. What I'm not sure is what Palpatine would do. Again, I'm, I'm hesitant on that. Because Palpatine... He, <laughs> the most likely thing that comes to my mind is that Palpatine would go ahead and initially try to use Revan in some way or another. More like, I should say more accurately, use Revan's faction. 
because that's that's Palpatine's style. Everyone and everything is a tool to be utilized for Palpatine's end. That's Palpatine's mentality. It's always been his mentality. So I think he'd try to use Revan and his faction at first. I don't know how that would go. If it went badly, which it might, then Palpatine would probably try to deal with him. And Palpatine would have multiple assets in his arsenal in order to deal with him at that point in time. So I, I don't know. I do think, let me put it to you this way, I do think in a one-on-one -on -one fight that Dooku would probably best Revan. If it was an even fight on even terms. Oh, I would easily say Palpatine's stronger Avengers. That's not even a question to me. <laughs> I mean, you guys saw Palpatine crush Savage and, and Maul like bugs, right? Still one of my favorite fights in the whole series. That is true, Takoida. That is very true. Revan's knowledge and interaction with droids would be an immense asset if he was able to keep that quiet. If he was able to kind of not allow people to know the kind of access and power he has over droids. Because it's it's the old saying, right? Nobody notices the furniture. Droids. It, it, this is every time, every now and again, uh, Star Wars fiction actually analyzes this point. I love it when they do because it it's it's a rarity. Droids are incredibly useful tools for someone who wants to use them to infiltrate or sabotage or whatever. Because nobody notices the droids. They're they're. How many times do you look at your your couch and be like, I wonder if my couch is updating over there? It is so built into the culture of Star Wars that droids are nothing. That people who, that Luke Skywalker was considered a weirdo for refusing to let R2 be mind wiped. That's how normal it is. That's how normal it is for droids to just be a nothing. You're awful, Phoenix. I actually just, hang on, is my couch plotting against me? No, oh, okay, we're cool, we're cool. We're cool. Hang on, yep, yep. So I do think that the droids would e easily factor into this because Revan has a unique understanding of the value of droids. More than his connection with droids, he understands their purpose and value. He would be one of those who would be able to exploit that. Would Revan shelter the surviving droids? Uh, I think he would, Adam, to some extent or another. He'd probably be very specific about which Jedi are allowed in, but I think he would. Now, DC guy, he wouldn't shelter any Jedi. He'd look at the Jedi and be like, no, you deserve to die. Get out of here. Because DC guy is secretly evil. I've been meaning to tell you this, guys, for a while. Um. <laughs> Thank you very much, DC guy. Would you like to put that subscription towards? Yeah, e droid rights were a thing in the EU, although they were not often considered, strangely enough. You guys remember the original Thrawn trilogy, right? I'm sure most of you do. It's probably it's one of the most beloved books in this in the EU. I just point that out because, for those of you not aware, the original Thrawn trilogy really did establish a lot of base points for what became the EU. And one of those things was droid rights. Do you remember a scene where Mara Jade actually is speaking in disbelief to Luke at the idea that Luke hasn't been regularly wiping his droid? Because it's just so normal that everyone wipes their droids that she's like, wait, what? You haven't? No, there's no way you haven't been wiping your droid. He's like, no, yeah, I haven't been. Are too special. Uh huh. <laughs> that was established all the way back in the Thrawn trilogy. Anyways, oh, I didn't even think about Ahsoka. Oh, Ahsoka would go with with Revan. Oh my God, you kidding me? <laughs> Anyways, DC guy, sorry I didn't answer your question. I have a website, website, website that you can see all the stuff. It's on the left, on the left column. You can see all sorts of stuff that you could put that towards for future streams, which will be starting up again, as I said several times, this Friday, which I believe is the nineteenth. Do you think he'd see the order? I don't think he'd see the Order 66 trap exactly. But I do think he would see the danger in just suddenly signing up and accepting that a clone army. The, the Jedi were always just a little bit too accepting of that, you know what I mean? That was always just a little bit too convenient. If we're being honest, that's probably bad writing. <laughs> let's, let's just go ahead and acknowledge that. Because it's like, we are the Jedi. Oh, by the way, there's a whole clone army It was built for you that's already been paid for. Okay. Who did that? A Jedi who's been dead for years. Works for me! You know, <laughs> cool! Yes! <laughs> awesome! I'm so looking forward to having this clone army at my disposal. <laughs> yeah, 
Yeah, no, I think Revan would see the obvious danger of the clone army in a nutshell. <laughs> How did the Jedi pay for that? Oh! What are, what are money? Jedi don't have to pay for things. Actually, that's, a, that's partially true. The Jedi, this is actually a thing. The Jedi are funded by the Republic because the Jedi are actually a part of the Republic government, which, as I've said several times, I think that was one of their mistakes. They are literally a branch under the Republic uh, gov governmental process, under the Senate and under the Chancellor's office. So they literally didn't pay for that. The Republic was assumed... My point is, I don't think the Jedi have an understanding of economics, is what I'm trying to say here. Which is funny how often that comes up in fiction. Someone doesn't understand economics and it goes badly for them. Huh. Anyways. <clears throat> they were suspicious. Yeah, that's about as far as that ever got, Pico. Hmm, there's a clone army. That's unusual. Oh, well. <laughs> of course, Kay. Why would you read that? <laughs> you got it, DC Gay. DC guy, excuse me. Nah, I'm trying to say K at the same time there. Because K is being insane. What would a privatized Jedi Order be like? Uh, you know, that's actually a good question. I was about to say Luke, but then I remembered Luke kind of attached himself to the New Republic, didn't he? Anyways, DC guy. Three towards Enderal Skyrim. Done. Thank you. <sighs> yes, Cashel. That was a thing. All right. Let's, let's move on to the next question. We have like three more questions. Uh, where's the list? Here we go. Okay. So this next question is still Star Wars related. But instead it's also Farscape related. How many of you guys like Farscape? Quiet question. Right? Somebody likes Farscape, right? Anybody? Okay, so here, this is another what if. What if Scorpius was the one who had taken up the mantle of training Je uh, training Anakin? What if Scorpius was the one who trained Anakin, basically? How do you think Anakin would have gone under his tutelage? Let's assume this is Scor F Farscape, or excuse me, Scorpius from like post-Peacekeeper Wars, just to simplify that. Really, De Gaulle? That's interesting. I understand that preference is a thing. I just don't get that one. Personally, I like to think of the Scorpius who is basically incredibly amoral, but not actively evil. Now, I know that's interpretation, but I've never seen Scorpius as someone who is deliberately malicious. He is, he is definitely willing to do horrible, evil things. But he doesn't do them because he wants to. He does them because he feels that they are the best method to accomplish his goals. Whether he's right about that or not is a completely unrelated matter. But my point being, I've never seen Scorpius as the evil person. I have seen him as the antagonist. Maybe villainous. <sighs> like, th his vengeance desire against the Scarens has driven so much of his life. You could argue that the, his vengeance thing against the Scarens has basically been all of his motivation for basically all of his screen time, up until and including when he finally sees the wormhole with a cherry on top. Remember how he follows... This is, Scorp this is the best way to explain Scorpius, in my opinion, from my perspective. Remember, this is a very minor spoiler, but there's a scene in Peacekeeper Wars where John calls him over, it says, you really want to see the wormhole weapon? And then he basically makes Scorpius beg in a humiliating fashion. Scorpius does so without hesitation. He, he actually follows his words so quickly that John can't even finish saying them before Scorpius is already right on his tail. Because that's what Scorpius is. Ends justify the means. He is a pragmatic more than anything else. You want me to, to sit and lick the ground? I will do so if it will work! And that's what Scorpius is about, accomplishing actual actions. 
that kind of severe pragmatism can easily turn into someone who is evil, who does horrible things. But at the same time, I gotta be honest, I think that would have been better than what he got under the Jedi Order. <laughs> <clears throat> Probably not, Ice Tray, if we're being honest. Anakin had the stack, the deck stacked against him from the beginning. The moment Palpatine was there, that was the end of it. Palpatine spent years upon years cultivating a friendly father-son relationship with Anakin. So regardless of Scorpius, Palpatine's continued presence and encouragement and aid and legitimate friendship is the kind of thing that I don't think would have really fixed that problem. No, the real thing is, what would a pragmatic Anakin be like as Darth Vader? If we're being 100% honest, what probably would have happened is Palpatine would have probably arranged for Scorpius's assassination relatively early on. Let's just go ahead and accept that. But, for, again, for the sake of uh, argument, let's just assume we have an Anakin under Scorpius. I, I've already kind of said this. We would have a pragmatist. We would have someone who has tremendous power and yet is exceptionally wary of that. Yeah, pragmatic Vader. <laughs> I actually don't know who that is, Malakar. I am sad. <sighs> A rageless Vader would be less powerful on the dark side. I'm not even going to say where I'm going with that. You know where I'm going with that. I guarantee you Revan would reach out to Anakin. I just don't think he would succeed. Yeah, I know who Jason Solo is, Marco. Malagor. I just don't know who Anya Kuro is. But we don't acknowledge Jason Solo is existing here. Yeah. <laughs> If I'm being honest, the closest parallel I think I would consider for what Anakin would become is the uh, redeemed uh, Ventress. I think that's the general direction I think a, a pragmatic Anakin would go in. Not completely, obviously, but more in that direction than anything else. Still someone who is inclined towards good. Still someone who is inclined towards being a decent person, but a very ruthless <laughs> decent person. That's a good question, Dakota. I don't know. Since Lord knows that there are literal dark ages in Star Wars history, it's entirely possible that arguably the tech of the KOTOR era is actually more advanced than the tech of the original trilogy. We don't have a good way of judging that. What did Vader want more than anything? That is a very interesting question. What media do I think has fully portrayed the full power of the Force? Now, that the actual question you're asking there, Adam, is what is the full power of the Force? Because the Force is an interpretive thing that everybody has a different perspective on, as I talked about during the Kotor lore run. Because if we were to just to say the most powerful person, it's probably just Force Unleashed, right? Ugh. Anyways, that's, that's my take on that. Um, I have another question for you guys. This is a very interesting creative question. It's about movies. You guys like movies, right? Not really, Nymph. In fact, Star Wars is actually pretty high tier in terms of some of its tech. Most specifically, its transportation tech and its military tech. Good morning, Spirit. Good morning, uh, Father Marseille. What members of the Jedi Order during the Clone Wars would join Revan? Hmm. I don't know. I could see Klo, and I could see the other one, who I always forget his name, maybe going that direction. You've seen a movie? Really? Hello, Rhino Noble. A <laughs> pretentious man -child. Wow! I mean, be honest, it's cool. I'm with it. The tactics are, that was a good one, I like that. What is the analysis that took the most effort of everything I've done? I'd probably say the Lord of the Rings sexology. 
that was basically a solid week dedicated towards just investing myself into this into the movies, and that just killed me. <laughs> also, I'm not sure who uh, Rob Ager is. I'm sorry. What topics do I plan to talk about? Well, we have a topic about movies, which I'm about to ask. Then we've got to talk about Resident Evil 3, Warhammer 40K, and Nintendo are what we'll covering today. I can see Maze considering it, but he, he just wouldn't. He's too blinded. It's one of his flaws. All right, so anyways, movies. So here's the thing. You have been given the job of being the marketing department. You are pitching a movie. Now, it doesn't matter what kind of movie it is. Um... It could be animated. Well, that was a stream to Autumn. He asked for specifically a rumination. <laughs> Streaming the WoW lore run just absolutely killed me. <laughs> that was over a year of prep time. In in addition to the like solid month and a half of streaming. That, that was... Oh, oh. <laughs> That's my magnum opus right there. <sighs> will I be playing Kingdom Hearts 3 on stream? It's Yes, I will. And it's on the website. You can see the exact time and date we'll be doing that on the website. Website, website, website. So the question is, you're going to pitch a movie. It can be whatever type of movie, superhero, fantasy, animated, live action, whatever. However, you have to pitch two movies. Both movies are going to be released at the same time. However, both movies are going to be from completely different perspectives on the same t story at the same time, with consequences and actions of one movie and one storyline affecting the other. Now the question is, how do you market this? And what would its story and characters be, and how would you make these movies and combine them one? But mostly the marketing side of things, because the, the rest of it is just... <laughs> that's a huge question. But how would you market two films that are each other from differing perspectives? Now... I'm going to go ahead and weigh in on this really quickly here because in my opinion there's two approaches you could take to this marketing wise. One is to be obvious about the premise and one is to not. Basically to give away yeah they can be of an established franchise uh, one is to give away the idea to the audience. Okay. Let's assume this is already paid for. One of the ways is to give away the fact that this is two, this is basically the same story split into two. And thus, you would have to show how the impact of this character over here is affecting this story. And then, in the, in the trailers or whatever from this other movie, you'd have to show this story over here, and so forth and so on. Um, thank you, Ryan and Noble. Uh, I'm going to save this for later. Obviously, I can't watch it right now. Mute, 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 mute. There we go. Be gone. Um, the other option is to not to basically not give away the premise and to just release both films and allow people to discover it on their own and allow word of mouth to spread, oh my gosh, these two films are connected. There's something to be said for both of those perspectives. There's something to be said for both of those mentalities. I'm actually not sure which I would lean towards personally because the former is more likely to succeed financially whereas the latter is more likely to succeed critically. So... Now, some ideas some people have said in chat for what they would do with here. Uh, first of all, a Nightwing Oracle movie. I already like it. Uh, Warcraft 3 from the perspective of Jaina and Arthas. Yeah, you can do a lot with that. Um, a dystopian future pair of films. So here's dystopia from this perspective. But then over here, it's also terrible. Sorry, sorry. <laughs> I mean, I could also comment on... Uh, well, this isn't quite the same thing, but there's the trilogy. The... Uh, the Unbreakable Trilogy? God, I can't think of the name of the original film. Bruce Willis. Uh, oh, God, I can't think of names right now. Mace Windu. <laughs> I can't think of his name. That was a trilogy. It was Unbreakable, and then... Split, thank you. I, I couldn't think of the middle one. It was Unbreakable, Split, and Glass, which I don't know if Glass is out or coming out, but Glass is soon. One way or the other. Oh, that's true! <laughs> I'm sorry. Samuel L. Jackson and Bruce Willis were also in Die Hard. I actually forgot about that for a second. Hi, Rax. <sighs> ah, yeah, I could see that, Dakota. So... If I'm being honest, I think the way I would market it, let's just analyze that question first. I would go ahead and make it have a similar visual style. You know how all the Star Wars... 
within their own confines. Each Star Wars film has its own style, its own uh, visual presentation. You can look at any given scene in a Star Wars film that doesn't include a major character, and you can generally say, oh, well, that's one of the prequel films, because they all have a similar visual take. So I would make both films have a similar visual style, but I wouldn't have the trailers or teaser information deliberately saying these are the same story. I would have it just look similar and allow people to put it together if they feel like it, hinting at it, without actually showcasing it, if, if that makes any sense. And then I would just have each, the marketing spiel of each, presented on the two stories and leave that at that. Hello, Jimmy Sheva. What's up? Um, that is funny, Kay. As far as specifics of a film, or films, I should say, I mean, anything I make has to be in the Imperium. That's, that's my own personal rule. So it would have to be an Imperial storyline. So two films set within the Imperium. Now, I've said this so many times that I'm terrible at films. So this is already a, a, a crutch for me. But two films set within the Empire, set within the Imperium, that have to be the same story from different perspectives. If I'm being honest, I, my first thought is to go to Primus. Because there are a lot of stories going on simultaneously during Primus. Um, a, one, I think what I would want to do is have one story following, let's call it the main party, Guido, Snarg, and Z. And then one story following Gerlin and maybe Dranith. Well, I imagine most of you don't even know who that is. And thus, both films are clearly set in Primus. Both stories are constantly interweaving into each other because it is effectively the same story, but both events are constantly playing off of each other and forcing each other to different ways. The only reason that doesn't quite work, and I'll admit my own flaw in this one, is the fact that Gerlin dies, spoiler alert, at a certain point in the story, whereas the rest of the story keeps going, and thus, that's why I mentioned just shifting it off to Dranath, but that's weird to basically have two separate protagonists in a singular film. I don't think that would work that well. I don't know. I'd have to think about that. Well, you are evil, Dream Whisperer, apparently. What do you mean, uh, taking place in a battle, Adam? I would do that too, Harriet. Wow, that sounds horrifying, Plutonia. I like that. One person rebelling against Big Brother, the other person, someone who is a part of Big Brother who legitimately believes the propaganda. Phoenix gives the idea of the rise and fall of Garrosh. Which perspectives, though, would you use? If I had to come up with a completely new story, my first thought is to set it during, again, this is the Imperium, set it during the Elven Civil War, where we see the, one movie would be done from the perspective of the proto-Bastion agent who's there, and the other would be done from the perspective of one of the Elves, and just kind of showcasing the how incredibly different that war is from an external perspective and an internal perspective. Ah, so Garrosh and the char the main character, gotcha. Well, that's kind of what, what Phoenix just mentioned, Tiggs are, but yeah, I see you. You know, one tells the that's also what I mentioned with, with Gerlin. Well, I guess Gerlin wasn't really a villain. <laughs> Whatever. You know what I mean. Oh, I get you, Adam. That'd be a heck of a film. A one battle stretched across a whole hour and a half. Yikes. I know real battles you know last that long. I get that. I don't know. Um, but having talked about this, more or less to fruition, how many of you guys like Resident Evil? Zalash was was the character one who uh, character name who killed Garrosh. Killed. <laughs> oh god, that sounds horrifying, Disco Inferno. That's true, Tigzar. It it did. Batman the White Knight, I can see that. Oh yeah, how many of you guys are really looking forward to Resident Evil 2? I know at least some of you are. At this point, I don't know if you guys have looked at the website lately, I have had, this is not a joke, I've had to come up with a new color categorization. Theoretically, this should never happen. The only reason this is happening is because I've been focusing so much on the YouTube side of things I haven't been streaming lately. So, theoretically, we should never have a premiere run that is 
has so much interest from so many people that I had to come up with a new color to in indicate just how much interest in that. We have two premiere runs now who are just... So many people have showed interest in them that I had, I had to come up with a new freaking thing to showcase it. If you're wondering what that is, you can see it on the website. Website, website. But... <sighs> the, um... Hey, Harian. Uh, no. <laughs> I have not. <laughs> uh, the question is, how would you... The question in summary is, how would you do a Resident Evil 3 proper remake? Now, on the off chance you don't know what that means, the very definition of a proper remake means it's good. It is, means it's really well done. Uh, the specific question... See you around, Christian. The specific question in, in full, which is here somewhere... Uh, what would you do to update the gra game mechanics, story, plot, characters, art direction, horror? What pivotal scenes would you alter to make better? Um, for example, this is an example he gave, uh, during the final battle, avoiding spoilers, uh, for gameplay and story integration, could you press the button to make Jill fire the gun? Wouldn't that be awesome? You know, that kind of a thing. So, three. Yes, this is the one with Nemesis. Also known as my previous favorite Resident Evil until 4 came along. Yes, 4 is my favorite. Go ahead and hate me for it. I, I mean, if, you're gonna, if I'm going to be damned, I should be damned for who I really am. I would also abandon the static camera angles without hesitation. Like, no, no, no argument on that one. Yeah, 4 is good stuff. Is it really, Zeiss? I've gotten some weird hate over the years for liking Resident Evil 4 the most. Usually along the lines of Resident Evil, 4, Resident Evil 4 isn't a real Resident Evil game. And I will agree, it's probably one of the least connected Resident Evil games in the franchise. You could argue 4 could be slotted out entirely out of the story and it wouldn't affect the, major, the overall plotline up to 5 or 6 or whatever it is. Well, yeah, Doom 3 is arguably not a real Doom game, but there's nothing wrong with liking it. I, I kind of get you on that, Renegade. Do you mind if I call you Renegade, by the way? I just, I noticed when I was writing it down, it's not really Renegade, it's Rene, Rene, Rene And if you want me to pronounce it differently, just say so. And I'll be like, you got it. And I'll try. <laughs> I will fail. But I will try. Purple's not an option, actually, Micromono. So, yeah, I, I, I agree. Let's fix the camera. Okay, Renegade works, then. Um... You know, you're right, Anthony. <laughs> I never thought about it. Leon is, is the time effector. <sighs> what, I'm, what I'm debating is would I do, like, tank... Would I do Resident Evil 4 or Resident Evil 2 Remake? Like, I'm curious which I would do of that, you know? Because Resident Evil 2's remakes looks like it's basically behind-the-shoulder, you know, action RPG Tomb Raider kind of style. And Resident Evil 4 was much more the, you know, the tank controls from behind thing. And I'm really debating on that one. That is true, Rhino Noble. I actually agree with you completely. Uh, in my opinion, that kind of multi-perspective story is, is more for the creator because it's an interesting thing to write and also more for fleshing out the world than being like, oh my god, you know. I agree with you on that. Bonus campaign is Barry. Sold. Um, <laughs> I'll tell you the first thing I'd do. Get rid of the the durability on the knife. Some of you know what I'm talking about. Um, what would I do with three? So the Barry thing, yes. Okay, so... In, in the realm of reality, we'd have to decide on the cameras thing. We would have to. We would have to pick one and stick with it. Because it's not just changing the camera. The, the, the camera choice affects level design in a significant way. And as a consequence, we can't actually... Like, like it would be difficult. It would be economically difficult and time-wise difficult to basically produce two different versions of all the stages and levels. One for the static camera and one for the follow camera. Ideally, that's what I'd want, if I'm being honest. Ideally, I would want an option to basically be classic mode, and then shkunk, and then you've got the static camera right here. 
but you would have to change up the level design, the monster design, the the where the jump scares are, where the health packs are, where the everything is, because the camera is now right here. You can't see down here, you know, stuff like that. Um, so that would be something that would it would be awesome, but. Uh, well, Nier Automata doesn't do what I'm talking about, though. Right? Uh, now, Harriant. Thank you very much, Harriant. I'm, I'm, that's my. That's what I'm doing this week, Harriant. Up until I, I, I hope to be done by Thursday. I hope. <laughs> we'll see. But nevertheless, I will put that towards Pathfinder. You got it. <sighs> um. But my point, Juanta, is it's it's not hard for a game to have multiple camera angles. Okay. If you wanted to do a thing where you had both the behind camera and the static camera, all you're going to do is piss off both groups, right? Because the people who want the new camera are going to be irritated at the static camera, and the people who want the whole thing to be the static camera are going to be irritated by the shoulder cam, right? It would be better to have it as a toggle, but a toggle would necess necessitate level design alteration, which is what I'm talking about. Still be great if they did that. No, I have not actually played the RE2 demo yet. I looked into it, but I haven't played it. Knife, knife, knife. So, let me, the very first thing I would do... This is just my knee-jerk reaction to this question. I would update Nemesis. What I mean by that is specifically the... I guess the AI is the way I want to answer that. Like, I would want Nemesis to be... As terrifying as he's supposed to be, you know? I would want him to be just high. Oh, God. And, and that would involve uh, probably updating not only his AI, but again, this would be an aspect of level design. Cha basically adding zone flags for areas where he could pop in, for example, or make it so that he can... For, for example, make it so that for an entire section, he's effectively following you, and whether or not he catches you would actually depend on you. Like... He is effectively an an, uh, uh, an object within the level as you're moving, and he is actively following you at his own pace. And if you take too long or you loot too much stuff or whatever, he will catch you, and then problems will happen. You need to get the hell out of Dodge. You know, something like that. Alien Isolation is actually a fairly good uh, parallel to what I'm talking about. And yeah, I would probably give him ways to traverse that are completely inaccessible to the player, which again would be an aspect of level design. Make you know, you'd have to flag just to name right off the top of my head a wall that he could just go through if he wanted to. And I would make that impact, like you know, you come back later that those bricks are on the floor rather than up in the wall, that kind of a thing. Good. Okay, I'm glad to hear that. Uh, very glad to hear that. Um, that's funny, Disco. I didn't even know about that. But yes, his, his progress towards you would have to be unrelenting. If I'm being 100% honest, I like the idea, though I don't, I, I don't know if this would work in practice, but I like the idea that what I just mentioned, he's, he's always rendered somewhere, he's always moving towards you, should always be a thing, rather than for specific sections of the game. He is always there somewhere in the world and always making his way towards you, thus making him a consistent presence as well as a ticking clock. The downside of that I can think of right off the top of my head is if you're good enough or speedrunning or whatever, it means you'd basically never see Nemesis. Because in the actual Resident Evil 3, he is scripted. At certain sections, he just pops in. He is basically effectively teleported into your path or into where you're at. It's like, hi! You know, that kind of a thing. So that is the downside of doing the always rendered kind of approach. <sighs> I don't know. I'd have to think about that. But I, that would be my first thought. Nemesis. We, we have to work out Nemesis. And yeah, as Takoya points out, having a whole game on a clock is something that automatically makes per certain people just kind of... Uh, about it. So, yeah, we'd have to very specific... I, I as always agree with manual crafting when it comes to level design. Hi, Remedy. Hi, Mighty Mage. So I like the idea that at least part of the game, he would be the always following you thing. Maybe for a section where for... I, I can't think of a specific example. It's been a long time since I've played 3. Please forgive me. But like, you need to do X to progress. X is in your way. So during this section, you're trying to get through X. In other words, you're base, this is effectively a, a plot wall that you're trying to get behind. So for this section, have it be the him roaming. So you have a timer, but it's only for this specific segment. And then for other segments, do something more scripted. Uh, having him just pop in or interact with stuff in the background, changing how you could do stuff, that kind of a thing. Uh, clock tower, there you go. That's actually a good way to put it. So in the clock tower, he's just there. Um, 
I think I think I like what you guys said. I, I like the idea of doing some scripted stuff and some uh, let's call it continuity stuff. I don't know what else to call that. Ah, Horient. Yes, uh, I answered that question last week. Uh, the the super quick summary is it's cool. Don't worry about it. Last week's lore week I discussed it in full. If you want more answers, just put, bug me on Discord. I'll type it up in full. <sighs> no, that's not stupid. My friend. Now, Epic Da Vinci. Well, he's not stupid either. He's actually really cool. But nevertheless, thank you very, very much, Epic Da Vinci, uh, as ever. Much appreciated. Thank you. I do hope uh, you enjoy my show. Would you like to put that towards anything in particular? Also, by the way, I didn't say this earlier, but hi. Uh, ah, no, I don't want to ban anyone. What are you doing, chat program? Questy. Yes, I did enjoy GDQ quite a lot, actually. Uh, really, no no real bad runs this year, at least not that I saw. There's actually a few VODs I still need to watch. <sighs> so, I'm not sure I would change anything up to the stories or the characters or the art direction. I'm sure everyone would want more gore. So I'd just go to the art direction department and be like, more gore. <laughs> I don't know how, just do more gore. Whatever. People like gore, do it. And then, at one point in the game, Al Gore shows up. It's like, hey, oh! Um. Well, there's Gore's theme song right there. No, I'm sorry. Uh, I can't think of any specific scenes I would really want to alter. Again, I don't remember RE3 as well as I'd like, even though it was my favorite for a long time. I haven't played it since RE4 came out. So it's been since the GameCube era, since I've played RE3. We did Takoya, you're right. I do have to admit that that's the kind of thing I would like, although that would effectively be a retcon of the entire RE series, because as we discussed in Discord, let's be honest, the T-Virus is basically magic. Let's just, just acknowledge that and accept that and move on. You got it, Epic Da Vinci. Can you believe that game's already out? I, I haven't been able to play a Just Cause, I've been so busy. Um... But yeah, no, I do like that idea. So what Takoid is suggesting is make it so that zombies effectively burn themselves out trying to get to you. The general idea being that the zombie is super aggressive, like rah, rah, is effectively shredding their tendons and their bones and their ligaments as they're trying to reach you, and thus effectively is destroying their own body internally as they try to reach you. So, for example, if you manage to stay ahead of a zombie for a sufficient amount of time, the zombie effectively kills itself. Like, not literally, but it gets to the point where it can no longer move, and it's just... Rah, and then you can just... Or... Yeah, their body's breaking down. Not in a decay way, but in a... They're literally destroying their own bodies. Because you know, this is a real human thing. Uh, you, in real life, have the ability to push your body to the point where you literally will damage your body. Now, normally you don't. Normally you can't. Um, it, it requires very specific circumstances to do that. But, you know, if, if your child is under a thing, there's a pretty good chance you're going to lift that thing no matter how heavy it is. There is evidence in that case. Or if you, like, are falling off of a cliff and you manage to grab and hold on to something, you're probably going to have severe hand damage after that because that's your body isn't designed to take that kind of punishment. So a zombie, theoretically, doesn't have the limiters on, on that kind of punishing thing. Thus, a zombie that pushes itself should have the consequences of pushing itself leading to the idea to quite as talking about, which I, I, as a consequence, actually really like that idea. I, I think that's a great addition because not only does it make more sense in lore, but it adds another gameplay element to basically being able to endure a zombie attack rather than having to specifically kill zombies that come after you. Now, it's obvious why they didn't do that in the original Resident Evils, because any given zombie attack was on one screen. <laughs> or make, like, three screens, you know, go around the corridor and then the zombie fight's over with. But, in a game where we have a more fluid level design, we could have a section where you could... And the zombie's like, oh, damn it! <laughs> it just falls over at a certain point. Well, a fresh zombie would probably take longer, because it's the same concept with a fresh zombie. I mean, if it was a real person who wasn't a zombie, it would be the exact same concept as a fresh zombie, theoretically speaking. You know, if you mind-controlled someone to push themselves to that level, that they would shred themselves. That's horrible, Kay. I, for the record, I wouldn't get rid of, like, the tyrants or anything like that. Because, let's be honest, one of the aspects of Resident Evil is the cheese. Like, like, we can all accept that, right? One of the aspects of Resident Evil is the the cartoony horror schlock shtick. 
And I like the idea of the magic T-virus stuff that's like, Wah! yes, and now I am this super strong tentacle death thing. <laughs> you know, I mean, come on. Yes, Ace Attorney's coming out at some point. I've already recorded that video. It's a good game. Oh, there's one thing that would be extremely important. We'd have to spend a lot of time being the most high-profile voice actor we can to play Nemesis. I'm thinking for humor factor, let's get Vin Diesel to play Nemesis. Stars. I'm sorry, that's a dumb joke. Uh, where's my notes? I do have more questions. Let's move on. Let's move on to the next question, which is Warhammer. Yeah, conservation of mass. Mm -hmm. I don't want to play Nemesis. Okay, fine. I'll voice Nemesis. Stars! That's <laughs> Gilbert Gottfried. How many of you guys know Warhammer 40k? This is a very interesting question. I admit, this one has kind of flummoxed me, so I don't know what to say about this one. Um... Oh my god, Rhino. <laughs> I mean, I love Trauma Center, so I'm all in favor of that. I still need to watch the, the VOD of the Trauma Center run last week. I haven't had time. I won't have time this week either. I'm crammed this entire week. Hey, Larian. So, hello, Exum. The question is basically, for whatever reason, let's just, let's just accept this, you are, the Emperor is dead. And you are now the leader of the Imperium of Man. What do you do? <laughs> no, no, no. You don't take the Emperor's place. You're just in charge. Yeah, probably, Takoda. <laughs> Try to become a space marine? Oh, that's easy. That's just a huge amount of genetic engineering and, and construction. Yes, let's assume Terra's fine. Let's also assume that the warp beacon still works, even though the Emperor's dead. Let's just, let's just go with it. It's the what if. I gotta be honest, my very first thought was suicide. <laughs> I'm sorry. I know Warhammer 40k too much and too well to ever want to be there. And I don't know it that well. A vacation manage mansion on each planet holding leadership attributes. Uh, yeah, let's assume... Okay, there we go. The reason why... No, you are the Emperor. That's the point, Mighty Mage. You're the Emperor. Congrats. You lead the Imperium of Man. That's the point. You are in charge of the Imperium of Man. I kind of think you're right, Harian. I mean, honestly, think what it would do to the Sisters of Battle, or the Chapters, or the, the Guard, to know that the Emperor's dead, right? I, I've had a theory for a while that that's exactly what would happen, Adam. Do you get the Emperor's powers? Um, uh, It doesn't say in the question. I think the real point of the question is, what do you do in charge? Like, you're in charge of the Empire, what do you do? So, so let's just assume the Emperor's not a part of the equation. You are just in charge of the Imperium of Man. I mean, let's be honest with ourselves, the Emperor's already not a part of the equation. <clears throat> but there's, there's the entirety of Warhammer 40k is such a no-win scenario. I admit I stared at this like, I don't know. <laughs> okay, so we got the Orcs, which we can't beat. We got the Tyranids, which we can't beat. Um...
<laughs> I mean, we don't need to go past that, really. Never mind the Tau, we're just doing their own thing over there, or the Eldar, who are stupid to the point of insane. And there's chaos, which I don't even want to talk about. <laughs> Lol, Adam. Oh yes, then there's the thing the Tyranids are running from. Have we ever figured out what that is? Have they ever unveiled that? Because that's been like a thing in the background lore for years at this point. We build a wall in space. <laughs> it's, it's like ten feet tall and made out of severely breakable steel. I'm sorry. Um... <clears throat> <sighs> Interesting idea, Takoida. Truly separating it, segregating it, like stopping it being an Imperium, switch it into a bunch of factions. That's actually not a bad idea. <laughs> there's, there's just this giant can outside of the galaxy just going... Oh my god, Max Time. Max Time. Why are you so evil? Well, that's a good question, XM. Like, unfortunately, we've had multiple retcons and multiple people writing for the lore of Warhammer 40k, so... At this point, I'm not 100% sure what is fully canon. I mean, look what they did to the Necrons. Uh, sure, Adam. We'll say we're at the modern era, whatever that is. The current era. <sighs> sure, Pico. Wait, I've got it. I've got it. Why don't we go ahead and pull an Armstrong? <laughs> Senator Armstrong? We're gonna make it, we're gonna make it the Old West again! I just, I just need some money! I'm sorry, mixing memes. I apologize. Um, I don't know what I'd do. I really don't. There's no winning. There's, there's no success, there's no victory in Warhammer 40k. So... <laughs> I mean, for example, someone had said earlier, let's reach out to the other races. Well, see, the thing is, if you, the leader of the Imperium of Man, reach out in peace to the Eldar, you will be ousted by the members of the Imperium of Man for heresy. For tolerating the Zeno. If you reach out to the Tau, same thing. You can't really reach out to the Orcs. There's not a lot you can do about that one. Oh yeah, the Eldar would also screw you over, because the Eldar are really, really stupid. <laughs> I'm sorry to keep hammering that point in, but the Eldar are just dumb. I mean, how many times, how many stories have there been where things could have been solved if the Eldar said, Hey, there's this thing here, but instead they show up and just start killing humans, like, oh, we've got to kill all the humans, why? Because there's a thing here we need them to not discover. The Dark Eldar don't exist. Yeah, Chaos! Yeah, let's reach out to Chaos. Hey, Chaos! <laughs> no, that wouldn't go well. <sighs> yeah, there's no... There's no... Anything. I, I'm gonna go with my original answer. <laughs> That's my answer. There's nothing to be done about that. There's no fixing that setting without Q-level powers. There's no, there's no victory there. The best possible thing you could do <laughs> would be to order all of your own troops to start firing on your own world so that everyone else could die too. Ah. <laughs> uh. That's true, Nero's ass. I've got an idea. Why don't we make a race in Warhammer 40k that's actually good? Uh, we'll call them the Tau. And then our fans will complain and we'll make them evil. <laughs> Anyways. <clears throat> oh, 
this isn't Operation Cinder. This is Operation... That's with seven A's, three E's. Next question. Last question for the day. There's a reason the only thing I've ever really liked about Warhammer 40k is the orcs. And that's the silly, cartoony, ah, orcs. Because, yeah. No, Adam, not at all. You kidding me? How many U's? Uh, I think there's two U's, and then there's the three E's, and then there's another one U. Then there's an A, and E, and then three more U's. <sighs> How many of you guys like Nintendo? None of you, I know. What is Q? Um, <laughs> I don't know how to answer that. I'd say omniscient and omnipotent, but neither of those are actually true. Very, very powerful energy being is the simplest way to put that. Do I like Warhammer Fantasy? I only started getting into Warhammer Fantasy very recently, as a consequence of the show, actually. Uh, so I don't know much about it. I have only played two games set in Warhammer Fantasy. Uh, one is uh, Vermintide. I'm still looking forward to playing Vermintide 2, consequently. And one of those is uh, Total War Warhammer 2. So that's all, I've, I've, all, all, the, all that I've poked into that particular setting. I know 40k a lot better, and have followed 40k a lot longer. Interesting gamut of answers. Here's the question. This is about lore. You have... This show, Adam, my show. I, I have a show. I don't know if you're aware of this. I have a show that I do. Uh, I put out about three YouTube videos a week. Uh, although that's actually down now to, to ten, ten videos a month. And, uh, instead of twelve. And I stream. I, I don't know if you're aware of this, Adam. <laughs> I'm sorry. Oh, I'm really tired. I gotta work as soon as I finish streaming. That's the best part, because I got another video to record. If you were to write the lore of the Nintendo universe as an actually complex world where all the characters live in, although it says based on the Brawl storylines, so I'm not sure what to make of that, uh, how do you explain how they coexist with each other? You know, Ganondorf, Bowser, Ridley. Considering their history, what kind of events do they attend or create? How the economy works? What does What is Master Hand to them and why do beings like Taboo attack them? So what this sounds like isn't really a Nintendo question so much as a Smash question, which I admittedly haven't put a lot of thought into. I've put in a huge amount of thought into Nintendo lore and Mario lore and Zelda lore and all that fun stuff, but Smash? Uh. So this is going to be a little bit more uh, contained of an answer. Hi, Justin. It's okay. I've, I've just been rambling about stupid stuff. Don't mind me. I knew it, Tazara. If it makes you feel any better, the next video I'm working on today is not actually a Star Trek one. I did that yesterday. So, basically, the idea here is this is Smash Smash Brothers. A Smash Brothers lore that actually makes sense. Now, I've actually had a few thoughts on this, predominantly based on Subspace Emissary. The idea that these beings basically can't die and don't feel pain in the traditional sense of the word. So... It, it kind of followed... Oh, my God, did the song finally end? That was an hour and a half song. It just now ended. Yeah, let's go back to Storm Peaks. So, I have to admit, the kind of culture that would be developed in a society in which you don't feel pain and can't die would probably logically lend itself towards violence, right? There's, there's, a, there's a degree of logic to that. No matter how many times you beat the crap out of this other person, it doesn't do anything. So I think that violent altercations would basically become the norm. Uh, rather than talking through things or, um, you know, otherwise politicizing your way through things, it would probably be more along the lines of beating the crap out of someone in order to try and uh, get your point across or whatever. Let's assume no, Harriet, although we have the choice in that. I would say no, because I don't like that idea, just to be blunt. So... For example, you settle it in Smash. That's exactly that's basically exactly what it would be in real life. Like, okay. Why would you do well what else would you do, Larian? The point is people tend to gravitate naturally towards things that lack consequence. It's one of the reasons why people tend to be awful people on the internet. Just to name one very specific example of that. Not that I'm saying you guys are you guys are awesome, but you know. 
Uh, I don't think the world would devolve into chaos. I think it would all become very patterned, actually. I think it would be the exact opposite of chaos. I think it would all make... Uh, the normal fighting interaction would become so regular and so ordinary that it would become just like a... It would be the equivalent of high-fiving someone, almost, you know? Or just saying, hey, dude, what's up? Hey! What, what should we go for to dinner today? I'm kind of feeling pizza. I don't really want pizza. Then you fight! <laughs> uh, okay. Now, there's another caveat to this. The way I would also have it is, I said there's no death. But there's actually something arguably worse than death that could be considered death, and that's the metaphor, metallication, or whatever the hell it is, right? Which, again, goes back to Subspace Emissary. The idea that if you are defeated, you turn into the, the toy, you know, the, the amiibo thing. Now, you can be then restored from that form by anybody who decides to to tap you with the right intent. So in other words, it's a fairly easy thing to get out of. But if no one actually did that, you would just stay a trophy forever. So there is something equating death. And I think that would be effectively the ultimate taboo, no relation to the character, uh, within the setting. That if you really, really hate someone, or someone has done something truly awful, or truly terrible, you trophy them, and then you like lock them up somewhere and slot it away. Good night, Adam. Uh, so that they stay a trophy, so that they are effectively actually dead, even though they could come back at any time. Someone would have to go in there and find them and get them out, blah, 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 blah. So, as Harian points out, he sees where I'm going with this, there would be a very significant political infrastructure naturally built in, because you would always want allies. You as an individual will always be at risk. All it takes is one lost fight to an enemy, and you're screwed, right? So... You would need a connection of friends and inter or, or allies who are willing to come help you and who you are going to will help. Which leads to my next point. I think that this setting would be incredibly factionalized. Like, I think that we would see, you know, the warlords kind of a thing, Star Wars style, with all different groups all over the place. See you around, Pico. Hopefully, hope to see you either Thursday or Friday. <sighs> Hang on, now, now that I've got my thoughts out, what Rhino say here? Uh, to... <laughs> oh my god. That's horrifying. What's... That is horrifying, Rado. He's... This, the taboo is the Nintendo fanboy who wants to collect all the figurines of the characters. I mean, that kind of is where you're going with that, right? I will make my own place with all the levels and stages. It'll be... It'll be perfect. Wow, Plutonia, that is horrifying. Well, social... That's an interesting point, Larian. As I pointed out, though, there is something to be benefited from defeating someone. Not only have you made your point, but they are turned into a trophy and need to be restored. So if you restore someone, you basically could have some kind of social bonus points over that person, except, for example. Oh, you didn't like the Lego movie? I liked the Lego movie. Sad face. Um... I do think that there would... You say there's be so, more social violence. I think it would be... I kind of agree with you. I think it would be more the social thing. Like, the, the, the interweaving of this. This would be post... Excuse me. Pre-World War I all over again, right? Everyone connected to everyone in very specific ways and very specific connections. Um, now, that being said, I also... This is just... Oh, that would be horrible, Dakota. Let's not go that route. Let's not go that route. Let's just erase that. Um, the other thing to be said, I think that there would be a difference between, let's call it normal fighting and professional fighting. In other words, I, I, this is actually a bad example, but you know, in real life, there's a difference between you going out and biking and professional Olympic bicyclists, right? Like, it's just a whole different tier of quality, of capacity, of skill, and professionalism. So I think the same thing would apply here, that, you know, everybody could fight to some extent or another, but some people would actually be professional fighters. Again, going back to, uh, to the beginning of Subspace Emissary, where it was Mario and Zelda, and I forget who else, several people who were just fighting together in front of a cheering stadium. You know, that's at the professional level. Kirby was apparently there. It's actually been a while since I played Subspace Emissary. The last time I played it was when I played it on stream. 
You guys remember that? I did a lore run of Subspace Emissary. The most common comment during that entire lore run was, There's lore in Smash? There was. <sighs> now, one of the things this person asks is, How would I explain the coexisting with each other? Honestly, I, this is of course just my take on this, but assuming we are basing this off of Smash and not off of the base Nintendo worlds, I personally think, is there a Mario Party? No, let's not go into that hell. My personal think, yeah, I know, it was years ago. Do you know this is going to be my eighth year doing this this year? It just feels weird. Um, my personal take is that this is not Ganondorf, that this is not Bowser, that this is not Mario. This is a copy, amalgam, basically a bullet point of the original. You know what I mean? In other words... Bo the Bowser we see in this Smash setting is not the original Bowser. It is just a Bowser who is uh, copied off of the most surface-level character traits of the original. Eff yeah, effectively a clone, Mighty Mage. And thus, I don't think there would be any... Other than the more vague sort of, well, I don't like you, I don't think there would be any of the specific problems of you know the, the things that Bowser and Ganondorf and all those have done within their setting. Uh, for example, Ridley... Is, is a horrifying monster over in Metroid. Just, oh my god! I mean, I'm not even going to get into the eating Samus's parents in front of her thing. Let's not even talk about that. But I would not have it be that Ridley, right? I keep wanting to say Ridley. It's so hard to say that. I wouldn't have it be that Ridley. I would have it be a Ridley. It, ignoring the fact that there's technically like three question mark Ridley's across the Metroid franchise even that's a question mark because there's one Ridley that just doesn't fit in the lore of Metroid but we'll talk about that whenever we do the Metroid pseudo lore run <sighs> you say that like there's a problem Magister. although since Nintendo has stopped being dicks about copywrong strikes I can start playing Nintendo music basically yes disco Although it's worth noting that, to date, only one of the Smashes has had any significant lore to it, and that is Brawl on the Wii. Um, I don't know if the new one has. I, I have played it, but only in practice. I've basically been trying to get better at it, so when I actually get to the premiere run of Smash Bros. Ultimate Brawl, whatever the heck it is, I'll actually be able to play and not be garbage crap at it, because I suck at these games. Um, but... I say that joke, I say that with, with a jocular tone, because I have to, otherwise I'll cry. I really do suck at these games. Point being, only one of them has significant lore, which is why we're basing it off of that one. Um, but yeah, anyways, the, the point, as Pyman points out, this would basically make the appearance of these characters far more light-hearted light of an overall tone. In other words, Bowser versus Mario wouldn't be like a, I am the villain of death, or... You know, I, I am the great hero who will stop you. It'll be more like, hey, Bowser. So listen, hey, uh, next week, I was thinking we could go go-karting for a bit. You know, it would be a far more of a professional uh, working environment with probably actual rivalries, but just rivalries, which is like the base level of antagonizement, you know? Wasn't that awkward zombie, said Slayer? <laughs> Pretty sure that was Awkward Zombie. But yeah, so same powers, not the full personality. Like I said, it's kind of a, a copy or a clone or a... Like, if you, if I told you about Bowser, the full character of Bowser, I would be here for a bit. There's a reason we're going to do a Mario RPG pseudo lore run someday is because there's actually quite a bit of characterization to Bowser, Bowser across, across the RPGs. But if you were to bullet point to bullet point Bowser, what we would have is, you know, uh, King of the Koopas, big, kind of stupid, kidnaps the princess. That's probably it, right? Like, just those three points. Now, that is not the full characterization of Bowser. See you around, around uh, Lord M19. But yeah, Disco Inferno is correct. It would be a characterization of Bowser. Character oh my god. Caricaturization, there we go, of Bowser, rather than a characterization of Bowser. Like full beard there, I could caricaturize him by saying that his beard is like five feet long, and that's his only character point. But he's more of a fleshed out in-depth character than that. So his Smash character would just be, Beard Guy! And he'd be like, Fuchaw! 
and he'd be like, you know, the beard attacking, stuff like that. It'd be awesome. Thank you, full beard. What would you like to put that towards? So anyways. <laughs> um, was there another part of the question? Oh yeah, we have to decide. So what the hell is Master Hand and Taboo within this? Now, uh, Rhino already said an idea for Taboo. The Taboo being the fan who wants to, sh you know, take them all in and keep them in his own little uh, mausoleum. Honestly, I'm with that. That basically is Taboo's mentality. The fact that he wants to have his own perfect little, this is my, this is my uh, display case of Smash characters. Put it towards Majora's Mask? Tell you what, I'll put it towards the Zelda pseudo lore run. How's that sound? Is that acceptable? Um, Master Hand and Crazy Hand? That's more difficult, especially since they keep changing how those function over the years. Because obviously, the original intent... The original intent was that Master Hand was the kid playing with the toys, and then Master Hand got to the point where he was actually in charge of just the villains, but also susceptible to Taboo. And then there's the point where Ta Master Hand was actually the the servant or whatever of the villains I, whose names I don't remember in the new one because I haven't played it yet. So I don't like that any of those ideas. Basically, I don't like the idea of the kids' hands. I don't like the idea of the the creator's hands. If anything, what I like the idea of most is that the Galim. Thank you. That's the one. Uh, no, it's the it's the density of lore variant. That's really what it comes down to. Uh, a me for example, I could do a Metroid lore run, but a huge portion of that will be talking about the game or just other unrelated topics because there's just not that much lore in Metroid. Same thing with Half-Life. That's why we called that a pseudo-lore run. So, you know, it's calm, you know. Um, that being said, the, the, the thing I like to do with the idea of something like Master Hand is basically exactly how it is kind of portrayed in Brawl. I hate to keep going back to Brawl, but it's the most lore we've got for the franchise. The idea of a being that's just outside of all of this. It is, it is effectively alien. It has nothing to do with any of the, the bouts or the culture of the people. And it kind of manipulates and interacts with them. And it is powerful. And it likes to just play with them. You know, again, gaining the, as was portrayed, gaining the loyalty of Bowser and Ganondorf, for example. And using them against the others. Basically just for fun. Like, that's what it does as, it, as its interactions with them. Now, that's Master Hand, the manipulator. Crazy Hand's a little bit trickier. I know, right? So it's there. Crazy Hand, I'm not sure what I would do with him. The Dragon King? No, I have not, said Slayer. Yeah, yeah, we got Kirby antagonism. That's basically exactly where I'm going with that. <laughs> like Master Hand being the, the zero or the nightmare that's just like, hey, let's manipulate this and let's get this. And of course, the Master Hands aren't super powerful god beings, but they are stronger than your typical person. So, you know, a Master Hand gaining the uh, th the loyalty of someone is something I could see happening by, you know, beating the crap out of them, in other words. I'm still not sure what I would do with Crazy Hand. Like, Mighty Mage says Crazy Hand is a failed clone of Master Hand, but I just... Mm. Yeah, I know, Disco Inferno. Literally on strings. Or chains, rather. Hang on, I really like this part of the song. We could make it so that the Master Hand and the Crazy Hand are basically just the opposite, polar opposites of each other on, uh, for lack of a better way to put it, a cosmological scale. Uh, this is my recent Cordance mix of the Storm Peak song from World of Warcraft. It's 30 minutes long, which is why I haven't released it yet, because <laughs> it's 30 minutes long. 
so in other words, Master Hand uh, representing manipulation, order, control, etc., and Crazy Hand representing... Basically, what, the direction I'm going, and let's just make this obvious, is the Vorlons and the Shadows, with Master Hand being the Vorlons and the Shadows being the Crazy Hand, and both of them doing their own things to try and enforce their own philosophy on the on this actual people, on the actual characters. I think that's the way I would go with that. Like, yeah, like Chaos and Cosmos. That's not a bad way to put that. Um, although, remove the god thing, because they're not gods. Now, we've already talked about Taboo, and I guess that's everything except for Galim. And there was someone else. There was someone in the 3DS version, wasn't there? Hang on. Let's see if I can find a list here. Yeah, is this the the Master Corps? Was that it? Yeah, that's what I'm thinking of. God, I don't know what the hell I do with the Master Corps. The Master Fortress. Am I remembering correctly? Was the Master Core like originally based off of the Smash, like the Ultimate Core Smash things or whatever? Nah, I don't know. Oh my God, Leslin, that's insane! Um, <laughs> I uh, I don't know what I don't know what I do with the Master Core. There's like no lore to it because there's no lore to that game. It's just, here's the thing. It's got a bunch of forms that it can attack you with. Okay, now I've got this. So what I would do, I would say that Crazy Hand was specifically trying to introduce a new type. Oh, no, I've got it. I've got it. Uh, Master Hand invented the Smash Core, right? That allows people to do their ultimate smashes. And Crazy Hand was like, oh, I could do that. I could do that even better! And it failed miserably, and the consequence is the Master Core. That's what Crazy Hand built. I think that's where I'd go with that one. And so Master Core is just kind of like... I think that's everything? I think we're done. We, we've answered all the questions. Oh my crap. It's been a long lore week. Um, so, as I mentioned, we're going to go ahead and cut this off. I've got YouTube to work on. <sighs> I... I'm sorry. I like doing YouTube work. I do. I'm just I'm worn out. Oh my gosh. But uh, I am going to be streaming again Thursday because we're going to be doing uh, something that would be... Uh, actually, I will not be streaming. Guido will be streaming Thursday. And then I will be doing the Ezio lore run Friday, 10 a.m. EST. So I do hope to see you guys for that. Hopefully I'll be done with my work by then and have a chance to actually get a good night's sleep. But for now, I'll see you around, guys.